Uh, as Oliver said, I work at Fastly. We're an edge cloud provider, which basically means we're a content delivery network. Whenever you connect to Spotify, download a song, or read an article on The Guardian, you're actually interfacing with us. We do around six million requests a second. Um, I've changed in my career from, from uh, developing websites to, to actually helping the underlying protocols of the internet. And it's a, it's a big challenge for me to change. And I'm, as Oliver uh, said, I'm a web performance engineer. And so a lot of my time at Fastly, I get to research and think about how we can make and deliver our content and our customers' websites as fast as possible. And that's what I'm here to talk to you today. It's definitely not a sales pitch. I'm here to talk to you about how you can make your websites as fast as possible too. So why am I here? And what, what does that loaded title of the first meaningful paint even mean? I mean, you're probably definitely wondering. And I'll tell you one thing, it's definitely not this. I was practicing this talk yesterday uh, in the office, and I left my notes of some of the things that I needed to change in it. So this morning, I sent this message on Slack to my colleagues, and they were like, oh, but they wrote the notes for me. They were like, oh, why am I even doing a talk? Uh, I just scribble of a dinosaur. So if you feel free to scribble some dinosaurs on your notepads and show them to you at lunch, pack my clean undies. Hopefully, I'm wearing clean undies. This one's definitely wrong. Don't talk to strangers. I would love to talk to strangers. Please come and talk to me at, uh, in the after party or at lunch. And this one, I don't even know what this is. Don't play the WOPR at global thermal nuclear war. So hopefully, I'm definitely not going to be doing that. So why am I here? Um, I'm here to talk to you about performance. And so I want to ask you a question. How do you measure the performance of your website? It could be your own personal blog. The one that you're building today, maybe for a, uh, the, your employer or for one of your clients. Have a think about it now. With that, the website that you were building maybe last week or today, how are you going about measuring the performance of this website? Should the, um, what, the, what does that mean? Ooh, I've, missed a, I've skipped a slide here somehow. And so should we be focusing on a single golden performance metric, that load event, the one thing that we need to optimize for? Should that even exist? Is there a single golden performance metric? And I would argue that there definitely isn't. Load and perception of it is an experience. There are multiple times throughout the user experience of someone loading a page. And so for years, we've been focusing on these metrics that's just first byte, document complete, load event, how many requests you sent down the wire, how many bytes. But a lot of these don't correlate to the user experience at all. In fact, they are how we built our website. So we optimize our stack for the sake of optimizing our stack. But loads, as I just mentioned, is an experience. Your users came to use your website for, for something. There's a context, there's a reason why they're there. It's not a single point in time. There is no single load metric that we should be focusing on. And we spent years focusing on metrics such as the load event but actually, that correlates in no way at all to how your user is perceiving and experiencing the loading of your website. And so fortunately, times are changing. We now have a rise of metrics, speed index, the first meaningful paint, which is why I'm here to talk to you today, and time to interaction. How long did it take for your user actually to be able to interact? We, we throw a lot of JavaScript at our pages now, and this is getting further and further. But custom, and I can't stress this enough, custom metrics specific to your business needs and why the user came there for. So on The Guardian, that might be how long it took for a user to find the article they were looking for or to read their article. For Twitter, it's that time to tweet, rendering a tweet. Or for an e-commerce site, it might be how long it took to check out your flow or how long it took for the user to find what they were looking for. And so I'm really glad that times are changing. We're starting to realize that load is an experience, and it's not a single metric. There's multiple metrics that do this. And when you start to focus on user-centric metrics like this, any optimizations that you do will ultimately just have a, um, increase the user experience for your users, and not just optimizing that stack to knock out a couple of milliseconds. And so we're seeing rise to this new sisterhood, this collection of metrics that we're starting to call human-centric metrics in the performance industry. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. And I really hope that I can change your thinking of that you should be think using these types of metrics and this vocabulary of things like this that when since from a user navigates that there are multiple stages throughout that experience and we need to be focusing on these metrics and measuring them. So the first contentful paint, actually when we actually painted something, some pixels to the screen, 
the first meaningful paint. We're going to talk about how we can optimize for that today. And your time to interaction, and finally, the visually complete. There is no single golden metric. At least I would like to argue that. So what does TTFMP, which is probably what I'm going to call it for the rest of this talk, or time to first meaningful paint even mean? Why am I here? So to put simply, the first meaningful paint is the time when a page's primary content appeared on the screen. So let's talk about this in sense of user experience again. This is the thing the user came here for. Hopefully, that you would have optimized your design so that the core context of the user coming for is above the viewport that, you say, in a mobile device, that that's what they came here for. So it's the time it takes for that content to be rendered to the screen. More detailed, it's the first paint after which the biggest above the fold, again, because hopefully you've optimized your content, you're going to be putting it in that above the fold. The fold does exist, I think, on mobile, but that's, a, that's an interesting debate. Um, layout change happened. And most importantly, I want you to remember this bit for later on, also when web, your custom web fonts have loaded. I've, I hear that we all like to use custom web fonts these days, much to um, my discretion, but it's, that is the case. So this is the meaning of this, but probably this is better shown to you as a visual representation. So time to first meaningful paint was first coined as a phrase last year by some very smart folks at Google. And they documented the process or the algorithm as, as such to go about ascertaining the metric in this white paper here. I will share my slides later on. And so on the top here, we have a graph, which is the amount of layout objects the browser is painting to the screen. And so when the browser parses your DOM, your HTML, it converts all of them first into an X and Y coordinate where it needs to paint that element on the screen and its width and its height. And you can imagine you have lots of HTML elements, so they're going to be building out. So each one of those becomes a layout object. And on the bottom here is the actual visual timeline that the user's experience for loading uh, search results on Google.com. And as we'll see here, Google do something really clever that they flush the head of the document way before you've even, they even send your search query to the database or their caching layers because the header bit of Google.com never changes, right? So they can flush that and the CSS for it as soon as possible. And then in the background, they go and asynchronously uh, get fetch your content. So they have a very fast start render at 1.5 seconds on a 3G uh, phone. But your content, i.e. the thing you came here for, the context to a user experience, doesn't come in until uh, 1.9 seconds. And you'll see here how that directly correlates to the amount of layout objects on, that was painted to the screen. So now we have an algorithm of which that we can correlate things that the browser is doing to user experience. And this is what the first meaningful paint metric is. And I, hopefully, I hope that this visual um, representation here um, sees, you can see now how actually load events and performance metrics should hopefully correlate to user experience. So again, let's have another visual representation. This is me loading up the Financial Times' website. Let's play a little game here. Who here thinks, um, can, let's see if we can find out whether the, we think the first meaningful paint was on this. Is it 2.5 seconds? Put your hands up. Is it three seconds? 3.5? Four? 4.5? Five? 5.5? Okay, so a lot of you thought it was 4. Point seconds and a lot of you thought it was five seconds. And the actual answer here for the first meaningful paint for the Financial Times was five seconds on a 3G phone on an um, uh, emerging marking network, network. So you're probably starting to wonder how you can go about measuring your first meaningful paint. And Google um, have helped us here. They built a tool called Lighthouse. Who here has heard of Lighthouse? Great. And this is a performance auditing tool that they've open sourced. And you can uh, download this as a browser inspection or as a node package. You can use it as part of your, on the command line or part of your um, continuous integration processes. And as part of this audit, they load up your web page in a headless browser, and they gather these statistical performance metrics at each stage throughout the loading experience. Even better, the latest release of Chrome, they've now actually built this into the browser, so you don't even need to download a browsing ex extension in the audits panel here in the developer tools. So this, again, this is me loading up the Financial Times and running the audit. And you can see here that it exposes my first meaningful paint time to interactive and consistently interactive metrics. So we, now we have a way of all of you can just go home, you can even do it right now, test the websites you're working on straight in Chrome to get these user experience um, load, load events. 
If you want to find out more about this and that collection of human-centric metrics, I strongly advise reading this blog post and checking out this video that was um, from Google I.O. this year. And they, they go into a lot more depth about why this is important and the roadmap of how we're going to start exposing these metrics as JavaScript APIs so we can actually beacon them back and have this as our daily, um, daily testing process. So obviously, I'm actually here to talk to you about how you can optimize your user experience for that first meaningful paint. And so to do this, I'm going to use a case study. And I'm, I like, there's so many times that we can do talks or blog posts about oh, how I changed a to-do MVC app, or I built a little demo. And I find that whilst that's great to prove concepts, it's not really a real-life uh, website, a to-do application. So I prefer to run case studies and research on, on real sites. And to do that, I'm going to use FT.com. And so disclaimer here, as Oliver mentioned, I used to work for the Financial Times. They've, asked, I've, they've given me permission to allow to use their content um, for, for the, the wider good of research. And also, they have a really good um, design and engineering team that do focus on performance. So this is no discredit to them. They are actively trying to make their website as fast as possible. And so um, <clears throat> to do this, this is what it looks like today. I apologize for the uh, Theresa May photo bomb. Uh, she doesn't deserve to make it into my, my talks, but sadly she did. Um, <laughs> And so we're going to, every test that we run, every app change we make to the FT.com, we're going to run it through web page test. Who here has heard of web page test? Awesome. So I personally treat this as the number one tool in my performance engineering toolbox. It's, it's free, for one. But most importantly, it allows me to test on real devices without even owning that device. There is actually a Moto 4G sitting somewhere in a server room when I paste my URL into this and run this test. And more importantly, it allows me to shape the condition of the network whilst that phone is loading up my website to that of what an average user is. So contrary to popular belief, the iPhone that is sitting in your pocket right now is not the median average device in the world. The median average device in the world is actually a very low-powered Android device, which is why WebPage Test now defaults to running a Moto G. And the free and 4G um, network that we're very privileged to have here in London and Europe, again, is not the average network speed. The average network speed is actually 2G, and 2G with a very, very high latency. And so latency is the time it takes from when I navigate to ft.com, that request going to the server and coming back to my client. So we're, we're lucky to have a very fast network here in the UK that our latency is extremely low, but many, many people in the world have very high latencies. So every test that we do, we're going to run through this rig as if the average user in the, the world has experienced your, your site. And it, I can't stress enough how important it is to test your websites using um, uh, conditions like this. And I've, I've made some assumptions for the Financial Times. I used to work there. I know a lot about the user personas of the type of people that I do work on it. But you, my assumptions are not going to be the same as the products that you are building on a daily basis. So you need to be asking yourself these questions. Where are your users based? You may be lucky. You may only be building an internal application for people in a call center. So you know quite a lot about them. But maybe you're building a news website, and actually you're, where are your users are all in the world. What type of device are they using? What is their device landscape? What context are they using your site? A lot of people tell me, oh, no, I only have a single context for my site, that people just use it when they're at work on a desktop PC. And that, I have to say, that's a complete lie. I don't think any of you today have a, are building a website that has their users have a single context in which they do use it. And what did they come here for? Again, we should be optimizing for that one single thing and trying to deliver that as fast as possible. So by asking myself those questions and making some assumptions of what I know about the FT, we're going to be focusing on trying to opt optimize the FT homepage for these bu budgets. We want to get a first meaningful paint within three seconds on a 3G emerging market network connection and one second on a cable. But again, don't take these as my golden lines in the sand. You need to go home, ask yourself those questions, and form your own baselines for the products that you're building. So any scientific test needs to have a baseline so we can compare any change that we make to uh, prove that we um, increased or decreased the um, first meaningful paint. And so to do this, we're going to pretend that the FT.com was written like this. This is probably how we actually all uh, n n make websites and deliver our websites these days and how we have been since 2006. You know, we've got our HTML, uh, our content as our HTML, 
our CSS is referenced as a single external file as a link element in the head of our document and our content becomes below. I don't care how you authored your CSS, whether or not it was written in JavaScript or in SAS and what crazy compiling pipeline you have, as long as you deliver your CSS like this, this is the vanilla way that we've been building websites for years. So if I was to run that version of the ft.com homepage through web page test, it would produce something like this. This is called a network waterfall. So put your hands up here if you've seen a, a waterfall before. Cool, but how, and it, honestly, no worries if you haven't, because we're, we're going to learn about what they are today. And so on the y-axis is um, the requests that the browser made in the order in which the browser made them. And so that kind of signifies their priority. And then on the x-axis, we have time. And for each request, that's broken down into how long it took for the browser to send the request, perform a DNS lookup, changing that human-friendly ft.com into an IP address. Then it made the request to the server, how long we had to wait our time to first bytes until the server responds, and then how long it took to download. And that's all the different colors in each one of those network waterfall segments. Web page test goes in further, and it helps us here that it separates every, every mind type by a different color. So we can clearly see here that we downloaded a lot of images because there's lots of purple. So HTML is blue, CSS is green, images are purple, and JavaScript is orange, and fonts are red. So by doing this already, it's telling us a story that we can quite easily read. And the more you use network for waterfalls, the easier it becomes to read the story this is telling us here, that we had a HTML and CSS file were both blocking. None of the requests were made until the, uh, image, uh, the image, none of the image requests were made until the CSS loaded. So you can start to tell us some interesting things here. And we have a green line for when the start render happens. That's not the first meaningful paint, um, but it's a good indication of when we started painting to the screen. So we have some baseline results here. Our first meaningful paint is 8,000 milliseconds on a, um, two, on a 3G connection and 2,400 on cable. So we're way above our budgets that we've set for a good user experience. So the first optimization we're going to make is to inline our critical CSS into the head of the document. Now, Many of you might have heard of this technique. It's starting to get quite popular over the last couple of years. And I myself have been advocating since about 2014. In fact, I spoke in this very room um, about this technique in a lot more depth. So I'm just going to uh, give you a recap for those of you that have heard of it and for those of you that haven't. But to do that, we need to first understand what the browser is actually doing when it goes about rendering to your screen. So the user navigates. They click on a link from, say, Google. And first, the browser performs a GET HTTP request for that index file for the home page. We have to wait for all those bytes to come in. Now, HTML has an interest, really fascinating thing about the specification, is it states that it can be parsed incrementally. So the browser doesn't have to wait for all of the HTML bytes to come in before it can start constructing your document tree, your document object model. So we, we don't have to buffer it all up. As we can stream through, as the bytes are coming off the wire, we start to construct your DOM. But at that point, we f the, the DOM will find the link element referencing our styles. And unfortunately, CSS is what's known as a render blocking resource. We can't continue to construct the document object model until we have all the styles. So we have to go off and perform the networking for that so we make a blocking get request and we have to wait for all of that to come in. Now, unfortunately, CSS, unlike HTML, can't be parsed incrementally. We have to wait for all of the CSS bytes to come in before the, the browser can construct what's known as the CSS object model. And there's a very good reason for this, because of, it's in the name, cascading style sheets, that you might declare something at the top of your CSS file, I want this paragraph to be red, and at the bottom of your CSS file, I want this paragraph to be green. And if we parsed it incrementally and we started painting, that text would first display red, and then a second later it would be turned to green. You might have a margin over here, and it's, then it ends up being like that, because we override our styles. It's actually a really good thing about the CSS specification that we can override like this. But that's why it can't be parsed incrementally, because we'd be doing this, painting with the screen like that. So we have to wait till we get all the full bytes. The problem with waiting is that we're creating a lot of idle time. So note this idle time here at the top, that the browser's renderer is doing nothing during this time, and we're actually wasting a lot of time. The other problem here is that we've created a single point of failure. If I was on the train and I clicked on a link on Twitter, I had enough network to fetch an article from the FT, but then I go into a tunnel and it's still performing that fetch for the CSS file, I've actually created a single, point of, a single point of failure. 
I have all of the content, but I don't have any of the styles. So we're actually, uh, by doing this in the way, I mean, uh, we're actually uh, causing contention. So what if we were to inline the critical styles just to the styles required to render that first part of our viewport of our mobile phone, i.e. the context, the thing the user came here for, into the HTML? Then we separate that from all of our non, what we're calling non-critical styles in a separate file and now we've completely removed that single, uh, that single point of failure and that idle time. Now the browser has everything it needs to be able to render to your screen within a single round trip just to get the HTML. And so that's what this, um, this methodology is. And it, it's more important about the theory rather than the implementation. So if we go back to our ft.com example. Now we're going to have this style block at the top of our document. It goes against everything that we've been taught, you know, of separation of concerns, having our styles and our CSS and our behavior and our JavaScript. And then we're using the new link rel preload that we're going to look at earlier to declare, tell the browser that the non-critical styles are now asynchronous. You don't need to block on these. Just continue as you were and render. I'm using load CSS, um, the filament groups polyfill for this. But again, the implementation doesn't matter. It's more about the theory and the methodology as the important bit. So let's take a look at our baseline again. And note where the green start render line is here. After we apply our optimization, look where it's gone. Because HTML is parsed incrementally, we've been able to paint even before we finished getting the HTML bytes because the browser had everything it needs in the head of the document. So we're shaving about two seconds of our first meaningful paint here. And also note that it's way before the rest of our asynchronous styles, the other green um, segments, are coming in. So we've now got a 63% improvement on our time to first meaningful paint. We're 1,300 milliseconds on cable and 3,200 3, on 3G. So that's a really good improvement already. But like most things in life, there comes with some pros and cons. The first one being, obviously, that we, we've no longer got any blocking resources. We've been able to eliminate a single a critical request. But hopefully, the eagle eye in the room might have noticed that we still have to load in our asynchronous styles at some point. And when they do come in, the browser has to calculate them, and that might cause a reflow of elements and actually be jarring as a user experience. So we need to make sure that all of our non-critical styles are definitely below the fold so that moving around isn't going to happen when the user starts loading the page. And this is really hard to maintain. I've worked on two very large projects where we did this, and it takes quite a lot of investment. There is a lot of tooling around, and I'd, I'd love to talk to people more if you are doing, using this technique, but it is quite hard. So now that we've been able to get our CSS down as soon as possible, how can we prioritize the delivery of our other resources? So ultimately, this talk is about how we can optimize our assets delivery. Um, and so we now, the CSS might um, reference some other resources that are critical to that first viewport. So how can we tell the browser that these are really important and I want you to do it as soon as possible? And that's where preload comes in. So I want to ask yourself another question. The website that you're building today, if you could only deliver three or four assets to, to the page, you might have hundreds of assets on the page, what would be those assets? to get that critical uh, user experience of just the thing the user came here for. It's actually quite a hard exercise. I, I find it hard thinking about the websites that I'm delivering. These are known as your critical resources. If you could only deliver two or three resources, what would they be? So let's do that exercise together for the FT. Is it the logo? Is it the fonts? It's definitely the fonts. Is it Theresa May? Is it the hero image? Now, fortunately, <coughs> Oh, sorry, so let's define what a critical request is. A critical request is one that contains an asset that is essential to the content within the user's initial viewport. So it directly correlates to our first meaningful paint and that good user experience. Fortunately, Lighthouse has got our back here, again, that same auditing tool. So we can run this, and you can ask it to say, what is your critical request chain? So you can actually automate this process. And so here, we can see that the critical request chain, the five assets that are needed for that above the viewport, is the hamburger icon, the logo, and the fonts. They're delivering three font files. This is crazy. Um, just for that first viewport experience. So you can now all go home and automate this, or at least have a look at what are the critical requests for you. 
So if you take away one thing from this talk today, and I, I please just let it be this, I don't care if you don't take away anything else, is that you need to be optimizing the delivery of these assets. Find out, identify what your critical request chain is using a tool like Lighthouse. Try and eliminate as many as, as possible. Do they really need free font files there? I would argue not. And then for those that are left, you need to optimize the delivery of them down the network. And how do you do this, I hear you ask? Well, if we were to remember the methodology for the first meaningful paint, it stated that it's the largest above the fold layout change, but also when web fonts is loaded. And so let's look at our waterfall again for the FT.com. Why, if for a first meaningful paint, and why on a news website I came to read some text, are the fonts delivered so late on in the process of the browser rendering? Right all the way down here, with, we've got about 10 images sitting in the way of the fonts, but actually the user only came to read some text. And so to do this, we need to go back and look at our browser's critical rendering path to work out actually what browsers are doing here. Why, if even the browser knows that fonts are that critical to the user experience, why is it requesting them so late on? So we perform our get for our HTML, we build our document object model. Those of you that are, um, play with JavaScript, you'll know that that's the DOM. So it's a tree-like tree structure that represents the body. The body contains a div. Inside the div, there's a paragraph. And we have the same for our CSS. It says there's a div, and this div is this wide. Then inside that, there's a paragraph that has this um, font to it, and I want it to be this color red. Those two street <laughs> tree structures are combined together to form what's known as the render tree. And it's the reason why we have to have a separate tree that then gets painted is you may have a large element, a paragraph, that has loads of text in it, but your CSS is saying display none. So there's no point in sending that information to the renderer because they're not going to render it. And the reason why I'm telling you this is at this point, and only this point, that the browser initiates the, the request for the font file because there's no point in it requesting a font file for a paragraph that's never going to be rendered. Fonts, by their pure nature, is extremely large and expensive files to download. So this is actually a performance optimization that the browser's doing, but it's having a very negative impact on our user experience of load. Look at all of this time that we've wasted here. We have to wait for the render tree to be constructed before it will dispatch it. And so that's what's known as a hidden critical sub-resource. The CSS, the, your font declarations are nested inside the CSS. So the browser can't even find those declarations until it's downloaded the CSS. Browsers these days have a, an amazing technology called the preload scanner, or the speculative parser. And even though the DOM construction has to stop whilst you, we're waiting for CSS and scripts, there's another thread that goes ahead looking in your HTML for critical resources. But because the font declarations are inside CSS, there's no way that the browser can find that to initiate an early fetch for it. And this is where, at the, work, um, the W3C's performance working group, we came up with the idea of preload, the preload API. And this uh, gives us a primitive that we can tell the browser what it needs to download. So preload provides a declarative fetch primitive that initiates an early fetch, but it separates its execution from its downloading. So this is a way of us telling the browser, you are going to need these font files. I know you are. Go and perform the networking for them now. And this is what it looks like. It has one form. This is the most common form. as a link element, so just like our style sheets. But we now have a new attribute called preload. Then the content type, um, sorry, the content that you want to download, the URL to it, and then its type, because its type infers its priority. So um, images have a lower priority than CSS and, and fonts. And so you can do this in HTML. You can even just generate these uh, preload elements in JavaScript. And my favorite, we now have a link HTTP header. So I can just decorate my HTTP response by saying, I need you to preload this thing. And note this no push attribute. We're going to look at that later. So going back to our ft.com experiment, I know that my critical request chain is those fonts. So I'm putting these link headers on the, on the response of the home page for ft.com of saying, please go and preload all uh, my non -asynchronous, my asynchronous CSS that isn't being inlined, my fonts, and my FT logo, because they're the things that are required to paint that first viewport. So let's look at our waterfall before we apply that optimization. The fonts are really low down. By this one trick, just of adding two lines to even my HTML or my HTTP response, I can move the fonts up like this. 
So for some websites, you are going to improve the rendering and the user experience of your text by up to two to five seconds just by adding two lines of code to um, your, your delivery. And I don't know about you, I've been working in the performance industry for a very long time. There's not been a single trick like this that has such a dramatic impact on the loading of our screens. So that now has a 65% improvement on our time to first meaningful paint. We've hit our budget on cable of 1,000 milliseconds, and we're very close on 3G of um, 3,000 milliseconds. Again, it has some pros and cons that we now enables us to indicate hidden resources. Um, but it's really easy to create contention on the network. I can imagine that a developer could just go and add all of the assets on their page as preload and get the browsers to go and download all of, all of them. But all you're actually going to do is create contention there. So with great power comes great responsibility. So we've, we've managed to improve it by 65% now, our first meaningful paint. So we could just stop there. We've done a very, very good job. We've hit our budget on cable. But surely we can go further. And this is where HTTP2 server push technology comes in. After 20 years, we now have the second version of the underlying transfer protocol with the internet. And I think that's quite a good job for HTTP 1.1 that it's managed to last that long. But I can and have done whole talks about this subject. I'm, I'm, I, it's, it fascinates me. So I urge you to go and find out more. But just out of interest, is anyone using HTTP 2 in production now? OK, so about 5 to 10% of the room. So let's dive straight in. What is server push? And to do that, we need to look at the traditional request flow. So we ask for the home page of FT.com. We send that get request. And then the server has to do some thinking. It has to make some database lookups. It has to render a template for, for the, all of your views. And then it sends it back down the wire. So we've created some idle time there. Then the browser starts parsing that HTML. It finds the CSS and it has to make a request for that. But us as application developers, we know that the next thing the browser is going to request is the main CSS file. So why can't we just push it down the wire when the user asks for the index file, saying, I know, browser, I know you are going to need this CSS. Here's all the bytes for it. And that's what HTTP2 calls a server uh, push, push promise frame. It's a data frame that signals to the browser, I am promised to give you these bytes. There's no point in you requesting them. And so how we can do that is we now have a programmatic interface that we can do this. And this is our dear friend, the preload attribute now. So we've chosen on, as an industry to settle on the way that we can indicate to a server, it has to be a HTTP2 enabled server that can do this, that um, to push, we use a link header. And so note that there's no longer that no push attribute on the end of it. And so when this goes through my server, my server wouldn't see, I, I see that they want to push critical.css. And so going back to our ft.com example, now, we no longer have to inline our CSS because we can push all the bytes. That's all inlining was doing, was ensuring the priority of it. So now I've taken my critical styles and put them back in a, a CSS file, so still have my asynchronous one, and I'm going to push those bytes down to the wire. So let's take a closer look at what's actually happening on the network connection at that point in time before we apply the optimization. I send the request for the ft.com, and I've got some idle time at the beginning, sorry. And then I have my start render because I've inlined some critical CSS. And then I have some more idle time whilst I wait for that. And that's where our first meaningful paint is. But you may be surprised what happens when we apply this server push optimization. I've actually pushed back my start render and my first meaningful paint. This has actually had a detrimental negative impact on our user experience. And why is this? So to do this, we have to have a slight understanding of what's actually happening at the HP2 server layer. HTTP2 defines this, what's known as a um, dependency graph, a priority tree. And so for every resource on the connection, that we give it a priority. And that's what I'm, the, browser, the, sorry, the server is going to send down the wire. Now, HTML has a much higher priority than CSS, quite rightly, because that's the core content. So when the server gets your response of your home page, it already has all of the HTML bytes, but it's also been told to push the CSS bytes. So what it's actually going to do, because of the priority tree, it's going to flush the HTML bytes before the CSS. So we're no longer taking advantage of the inline CSS being inside our HTML. And so this is what our network waterfall looks like. The interesting thing here to note is on our critical CSS, even though it was pushed, you can see that there's no segments for requesting it. And that's proving that it was pushed. The browser never requested this, which is why WebPageTest is just showing us 
a small segment. So I want to stress here, even though this is a negative effect, if, for instance, you're building large JavaScript applications there and um, you're not inlining any content, this can still be a very, very, very good optimization for you. So here we can see that we've actually had a 43% uh, improvement on our baseline, a negative impact. If you want to learn about more of this, about how the pros and cons between HTTP push and all of the browser inconsistencies, Jake Archibald um, of um, uh, Google has written a really, really good uh, blog post detailing all the ins and outs on it and the pros and cons and what you need to be testing for when you're starting to use server push. So the question I beg here is, is indicating push via the HTML response actually too late in the connection state for us to send um, that down the wire? And I would argue that it is. And this is where async push comes in. And this is where um, a, a, a term in the industry that we've, we've started to use to denote a new way of pushing resources using HTTP2. Because what we actually need to do, as we noticed there, we need to decouple the semantics of what I want to push from my response of my HTML. And this is where async push comes in. So let's go back on that connection state again. Remember that where what we actually really want to take advantage of is that idle time whilst we're waiting for the HTML file to be generated. We're waiting for the database lookups, the templating, our server to do all of that. Actually, bandwidth is very, very underutilized at this point, and this is the point at which we really want to be pushing our resources. So again, it's all about the theory and the methodology, not the implementation, but let's imagine here I'm using Node's new HTTP2 server, and if many of you might have used Express-style um, uh, middleware, the first thing I'm going to do inside my request handler is open a, a push response down that wire. So the only way you can do this is if you have access, programmatic access to the underlying network link. And then you go and fetch your data from your database and your template rendering. So you're decoupling it from the response. You're not using those link headers. And so now, if I was to run that test on FT.com, this is the waterfall it would produce. And note here, we've hit the holy grail of using that idle connection time. Note where the, green second, the first green segment is, that it's in the, time, the response time. We're not, we haven't even fetched a single byte of HTML yet because the server was still thinking. So we've hit that holy grail of delivering our asset, our most important asset, as soon as possible. And so for this, we now have a 68% improvement on our um, time to first meeting for paint, the best user experience that we could do, and delivering our assets as um, optimal as possible. Again, this has some pros and cons, that we're using the idle time, and it shores, ensures delivery before any preload semantics would, but it requires custom server logic. It's very hard to debug things like this with push, and it can create contention on the network unless you test. So I can't stress enough how you have to be testing with HTTP2. So we've talked a lot here about the initial view, the first time the user came. What about the repeat view? If I was to push some resources down, and I was going to do that every time, hopefully I'm caching my CSS, and the user will already have that. And that, this is where the purple pattern comes in. I wanted to, part of this talk, when I was writing this talk, I wanted to show you how new technologies such as the Service Worker API can enable us to prevent this. But I don't have the time for that. So I urge you, if you want to think about how you can optimize for your repeat views as well, go and read up about the purple pattern. And also, I've mainly talked about CSS and fonts. What about JavaScript? I know a lot of us are starting to move towards single page web applications and throwing a lot of JS down the wire. The good thing about this is every optimization that we've applied, especially things like preload, apply for JavaScript as well. And I talked at the beginning about the sister metric to first meaningful paint of time to interaction. You no longer should just be focusing on a single metric, you should be focusing on multiple ones. So as well as measuring your first meaningful paint, you should also be measuring how long it takes for the JavaScript to execute and kick in and for the user um, to, to interact. And if you are a single page web app, that's the type of metric that you should be focusing on more. So a combination of all these techniques, we've achieved our target goals, but what does this mean to the user experience? Again, we talked about the fact that these are human-centric metrics. And so this is what it looks like to the user, all the way for every optimization we applied. And I don't know about you, I think that this is a much better loading user experience than that at the top. And this is what it looks like visually on a 3G uh, emerging marking network on a um, Moto G. And I, I think that's really impressive. So I just wanted to end on 
what is the future here for asset loading? We now know asset loading is much harder than most of us thought, but there are some new specifications coming out that's going to help this even more. When, when we outlined in server push, we, we knew that the link header is far too late in the connection state to be telling us what are the critical resources that we want to push. So a colleague of mine has um, proposed the 103 uh, specification. None of us really know about the 100 status code range. It's about an informational range. And this is a way that a server, whilst it's still thinking, can flush an early response of just some headers saying, I'm still doing my work, but you can go and download these resources. These are the critical resources. And so I'm really looking forward to this. And then the second one is, we noticed that what about that repeat view? If I was to constantly push assets to the user every time, they may have it in their cache. But there's no way of servers knowing what a user has got in its cache for that website. And this is where the cache digest specification comes in. The browsers are going to be able to tell the server, these are the resources that I have in my cache. You don't need to send me any of them. So we're actually going to utilize the connection now. And I'm really, really excited about this. So in closing, this has been a whirlwind tour of how um, asset loading in the browsers and I've only really scratched the surface, but I really hope that I've given you a toolbox of methodologies to go and apply that to your websites today. And please come and chat to me afterwards. We know that resource loading is hard now. Bandwidth is often underutilized. So you need to identify what your critical request chains are, use tools like Lighthouse to do that, and optimize for them. Again, that was that one key takeaway from this talk today. And use preload where possible to indicate what those resources are, especially fonts. Try and push critical assets, but only in repeat view. And please, please test, which is why I end on always be testing. The things that I've told you today may work in some conditions, may work and won't work in others. So use tools like web page tests and be constantly evaluating and monitoring the performance of your user experience. Thank you very much. My slides will be up online there, and you can catch me on Twitter there. <laughs>